Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, what's up? Um, I'm David Millsaps, and I'm so pleased to have you here today at our first Redox Tech Talk. Um, if you want to see more content like this in the future, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to have more technical focused uh, events like this in the future. Um, and if you have any questions during today's presentation, feel free to use the ask a question uh, feature down at the bottom of the screen. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Nick Hatt. He is a product designer here at Redox, but he is also an expert and frequent speaker on fire. Um, today, he's going to be introducing uh, the, what is an API and what, and what is fire in that context. So we're so excited to have him here. Take it away, Nick. All right. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, like, like David mentioned, um, feel free to use that ask a question button at the bottom. And I'll, I'll just kind of watch them as the presentation is going on. And if um, you have a question, I'll try to answer it in line. Otherwise, we can do, we'll do Q&A at the end. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun. I kind of have a few goals for everyone uh, and, and sort of what I want to get out of this talk. Um, there's a lot of resources out there for what an API is and what Fire is. You know, I have a certain take on it, and I'm I'm here to share my take. Hopefully, you're a little bit more cool and hip, uh, and you're more of an API connoisseur by the end of this. Um, I'm gonna get into sort of what I see as the benefits of Fire, and it's pretty you know technical, I think. Um, so that should be fun, and then meditate a little bit on the problems that Fire doesn't solve and what the industry sort of needs to do to solve for them. And this talk <laughs> was motivated by me talking to David. Um, there, there's been a lot of fire in the news recently. It's essentially the law of the land in the United States now, as of um, you know a few weeks ago. And I've been to a lot of webinars around APIs and fire, and it's kind of the same spiel. Um, Different people who have no technical background um, give different takes on what an API is. Usually it goes like this. They give you the definition of the acronym, uh, just like that. And then they go into like maybe the first paragraph from Wikipedia and don't really go beyond that. Um, you know, it's, it's really funny. I think lawyers are probably the worst at it. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit different approach. I think APIs are so fundamental to the modern world. And you know, I think I even take for granted uh, how prevalent they are. Um, and yeah, there's a, a picture of an API IPA, um, which I would like to try someday. So APIs have existed in large part since like the 1960s. Um, it's hard to put a start date on it. But it's essentially, as soon as there were computer systems large enough where integrating two systems made sense, uh, that was that's where APIs come from. It's so fundamental to everything we do. You know, as as you're watching this webinar, um, your browser is you know interacting with whatever operating system you're running's APIs to actually like display stuff on the screen, um, to allocate memory, to you know swap the disk. Um, the site that you're using, be it YouTube or Crowdcast, um, you know, is using APIs that the browser provides to actually, you know, render the content and stream the data. Um, and then that actual video data provider has an API as well that the browser is in turn using to stream the data and render it. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're not necessarily in the heydays of APIs either. Um, I, I put a screenshot in here of. What I, what I think is kind of a, a great example of APIs. Um, I was lucky enough to start my career. I guess lucky is maybe a stretch. I started my career at an EHR vendor who used VB6 and still does today. And uh, Microsoft in the 90s just had a killer API. It was really easy to write a software application that ran on Windows, uh, and they really reaped the benefits of it. And that VB6 application still runs today because Microsoft took care of the API and, and made it backwards compatible and uh, has sort of supported it, um, even though they're trying to kill it off. Um, you can build a billion dollar company on top of this stuff. So 
um, the APIs are really central to a lot of the economy today. Um, there's there's sort of this term called the API economy, but it's it's really just the real economy. Um, if you don't read the blog Stratechery, uh, I highly recommend it. He does, uh, as you probably guess, a combination of tech and strategy, and he does these great drawings. Um, so this is this is sort of like value chains for for businesses. Uh, on the left is the iPhone. On the right is more of a Windows model, and you have uh, consumers and third-party applications, and then sort of the platform where all the money accrues. Um, in this case, the iPhone has the App Store in between, so users pay the App Store, and then the third-party developers also build on the iPhone, which increases sales of the iPhone. In the Windows world, it was much more like third-party developers built on Windows, and then that increased the sales of Windows because everything was built on Windows and ran on Windows. Um, the, the thing here, though, is that those little X's between the third-party developers and the platform, those are APIs. So APIs are central to sort of any kind of dominant technology platform. And if you go back through history, all the way to like, you know, IBM System 360, uh, having good APIs was essential for these things to uh, proliferate. And today in healthcare, we're kind of in a weird place. Um, like I mentioned, the regulations, the government is forcing, well, not forcing, but heavily incentivizing software vendors to make APIs. Um, it's a little bit unprecedented uh, in the world. You know, I think the next closest thing might be talks about social network companies having to open up more and, and share their their graph with other social like sites, but that's not really going anywhere. Um, I, I think the big question is why don't we see more APIs in healthcare in general? I think it's probably a topic that's worth a, a PhD dissertation, um, if not a much longer uh, Redox webinar. Um, but they, ha they have, they're, they're, it is so sort of a more nuanced situation. So APIs have been around in healthcare for a long time. They just haven't been as accessible as they are today and then they are becoming. Um, and this is a, a sort of meme that I created um, where much of healthcare today, with these new regulations we're talking about, um, the government is forcing companies to act. Um, for the most part, we've been uh, healthcare has been reactive, where a customer uh, of a of a software vendor, say an EHR vendor, pays them, you know, to to open up a little bit and integrate a particular product. Um, meanwhile, the rest of the world is, you know, their their really business model is driven by people using their API. So the more integrations they have, the more powerful the product is, and the more successful the customer ultimately is. Um, and then you have API companies like Redox where, you know, we need APIs to power our APIs and um, every, everything just becomes scriptable. So, yeah, just to sum up what an API is, I think it's useful to kind of just cross out one word at a time. Um, take away the case came programming is really really painful. This is the world of bespoke integrations. Um, I don't know, screen scraping came up recently in a, a call I was on. This is really like screen scraping. So you're just kind of having to go into each different situation and figure out something different um, that there isn't a well-defined interface. It's an interface, but it's you know just kind of there and you have to interpret it on your own. Um, so that's, that's not an API. If you take out the programming part of it, you know, this is just the user interface. So like, uh, if you don't have ways to automate things, you have essentially two people, you know, people manually entering stuff in two different systems. Um, that defeats the whole purpose. The The idea of an API is that you can reduce friction by automating things um, and making two programs talk to each other. And as you reduce friction, um, the API becomes more powerful. So I think you see a positive correlation between sort of how much time it saves and how valuable the API is. And next, if you take out the application, um, you just have an interface. And this is what Fire is. So 
I, I make the bold claim here that Fire is not an API. Um, and I think that's not too controversial. Um, the front page of the Fire documentation um, says Fire is a standard. So standard is a little bit different than an API. Um, and Fire does describe an API that can be implemented, um, but they're, they're pretty clear to talk about implementers and, and what needs to be done to use Fire. So that's, that's sort of my overview of what an API is. And I'm going to hop a little bit into what Fire means to me and what, you know, what I think some of the strengths are and what some of the weaknesses are. Going back to that initial motivation for this talk, I see very similar presentations from, you know, lawyers, non-technical people about what Fire is. Um, usually it starts with a definition of what the acronym means. Um, move, this one moves into a little bit of a definition of what the word resource means, because that might be the one thing you don't understand from the acronym. Uh, usually, you know, one, two, three terrible fire puns, and then uh, continuing with whatever content that particular person wants to present. So my, my view is going to be a little more nuanced. Uh, and actually, I, I, I like to think about this um, as an analogy. And I'm going to use this throughout the talk. Uh, and, you know, apologies to everyone who's, who's you know, in their lunch hour right now. Um, hopefully you can uh, get something delicious to eat after this. But I think of it as, as sort of like the difference between talking about French cuisine and an actual French restaurant. So when you talk, you know, fire is, is sort of like talking about French cuisine in the abstract. There's a lot of core nuggets to it. So there's, you know, a base fire definition, uh, just like French has like the mother sauces, right? Um, there's different regional styles. So fire can be adapted to be used wherever you need to use it in the world. Um, the United States has certainly like been a leader in, in building out some of the, the artifacts you need to use it in a local setting, but, you know, it's wide open. Um, and it doesn't, you know, there's not really any strict rules about how you use it, right? Um, if I go and pull a recipe and make it, there's no French cuisine police that comes to my house and tells me I did it wrong. Same thing for fire. If I am using fire in a sort of weird way or a bastardized way, there's no HL7 police that's going to come and shut me down. Um, you know, I, I, it might not be the most scalable solution, but I can do it. And then... You, you know, you might have a favorite French dish, right? Um, that think of that as sort of like your preferred way to integrate, right? You need this set of resources to make your application work. Um, that is kind of something you can get from the base fire specification. You say, hey, I need this data to make my application function. The actual API though, is an implementation of fire. So it's, it's a French restaurant. Um, there's a real tangible interaction there. There's some value being exchanged. You pay money for food, um, you eat the food, and there's different considerations. So um, maybe you work with an EHR vendor and you got to think about the service and the, the price of, of all the stuff that you're, you're getting with you know, your actual integration. Um, maybe the food is great, but the, the waiters are really rude. Um, Maybe you get some other stuff with it too. Uh, not everything can be expressed in Fire, so maybe you sort of have access to complimentary services and things like that. And then that favorite dish that you have, sort of in the abstract, maybe they don't make it. Maybe the chef just doesn't like it. Maybe they're out of muscles that day. Um, you get a lot of like variations in the actual implementation. And I think the, the concept of a resource is central to fire too. So um, the, the idea of a resource comes from um, an architectural paradigm called REST. And it's you know really cool to kind of dig into REST and understand it. Um, it's sort of the reason that the web is as scalable as it is. A lot of the ideas from REST were put into the early web HTTP um, and sort of the, the actual like network architecture that powers it. Um, and Fire like rightly borrows a lot of these ideas 
to, to get some of the same benefits, the scalability and the, the repeatability of integrations. Um, the first one of those is the uniform interface. So yeah, if you've ever you know, seen HTTP verbs, get, post, put, that's sort of the idea. Um, there's a consistent set of verbs that you can act on resources with. And no matter where you can go, you can expect that same behavior. So uh, if that request is being proxied through multiple servers, um, that like language doesn't change. It's, it's just sort of the same thing and the content is a little package that goes with it. Um, in the restaurant analogy, I think the uniform interface is like providing a menu with pictures. So if you go to a French restaurant in France and you don't speak French, uh, and they have pictures, that's that's sort of a, a universal interface, right? You can point to it and say, I like that. A um, little bit different there, but yeah. Uh, statelessness is another key architectural principle of REST where the server doesn't necessarily have to know anything about the client between requests. So the <clears throat> an example of that would be, you know, I make a, a Let's say I admit a patient, right? If that's like a two-step process, I shouldn't have to, as a server that's admitting a patient, uh, keep track of that between steps. Um, everything should be sort of self-contained and that app pushing the data to me needs to provide everything I need to all the context I need to actually do the action in my system. Um, in a restaurant world, this is like, you know, not taking reservations. You um you know you you're you're more exclusive but you also just don't have this extra infrastructure that you need to, to handle that you're not having someone answer the phone um you don't take down dietary preferences for example so your chef just makes whatever they want if people don't like it that's what they get it's just a lot simpler to to build on the the back end um and then uris is another key component of rest so uh this is a newer concept in healthcare and you know a lot of us are really sort of familiar with URIs and the forms of URLs that we see in our browser every day, um, but it's very new in healthcare. Um, this is a little quiz section of the presentation, um, and I, I pulled this from a, a blog. Um, just in the chat or in your head, you know which which one of these URLs are restful. give you a minute <laughs> it's actually a trick question so uh, URLs are totally like separate from the idea of rest um, they they're not meant to be understood it's just that they like the mere existence of a URL is what's important to rest so uh, I remember a certain point uh, in the history of the web, maybe like 2008, uh, Ruby on Rails was becoming more popular and people were putting sort of real uh, readable URLs into their, their products. Um, so you'd have things like, you know, that first one where it's like events, beer, Oktoberfest 2016 slash join. Um, that's great for certain purposes, but that doesn't make it restful. Um, the real restful part of it comes from sort of what's happening behind the scenes and how you're using that particular URL. Um, but in healthcare, uh, this is kind of a really powerful and new thing. Um, the previous standards that are really, you know, sort of form the backbone of healthcare and operability today are HL7 version two and CDA, which is sort of an extension of HL7 version three. They're, they're really like a prefix meal at a restaurant. You go in, the only thing you can order is, is a five course meal. You pay one price and maybe you have some choice um, between the entrees, but you get, you're gonna get what the chef wants you to get. Um, the URIs make fire more a la carte. So you can sort of slice the data down to exactly what you want. Um, and the entry point can be sort of wherever you want it to be. So if you want to start with all the patients that have diabetes, for example, 
you can start with the problems and then go out to the patients versus say with one of the other standards, you have to start at the patient. You have to start at the document level. You have to start at like the event level in HL7 version two. Um, it's it's just kind of a, a new paradigm that, that offers flexibility like that. Um, and I, you know, uh, Fire does have a, a sort of universal architect named Graham Greve. Uh, and I, this slide was just so good, I just had to steal it word for word. Um, this is probably the best explanation of what a resource is. And this is actually from 2014. So it's, uh, it's already six years old um, and still holds true. So uh, if there's a god of fire, uh, it's, it's Graham. And I love the non-examples here. So um, the, the boundaries between resources and fire um, are really important. And some things like gender are too small. That's just a set of values. It doesn't make sense to, to, to like model it as a whole object, as a resource. Um, conversely, an electronic health record, that's a very broad topic. Uh, it's too big. That's not one resource. That's going to be many, many resources. Um, blood pressure is too specific, right? If you had a resource for every type of measurement or observation about a person, um, that number would of resources would balloon to the point where it's sort of incomprehensible. Um, and then, yeah, intervention, again, too broad. So you got to kind of find the right balance of, of what um, is something repeatable and appropriately sized is like, it's like object oriented design. Um, and the, the examples of the resources here ha haven't really changed too much since 2014. Um, there's, you know, sort of the, the core people, places and things, uh, patient, practitioner, organization, location. And then there's clinical data. So meds, problems, allergies, all the kind of things you'd actually want to look at to make a decision about a patient's care. Um, one of the really interesting things is the infrastructure part. So this is what makes Fire very, very different from previous specifications. And I'm going to jump into that. Um, the last thing I'll leave on this slide is that, you know, the goal in, in 2014, I think there was maybe 50-ish resources max. Um, the goal was 100 to 150, and they're currently at 143. So we'll see uh, what the, you know, the sort of next few years will hold for, for new resources in Fire. Um, I think there's definitely a few that, that need to be broken up even further. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, the, the infrastructure piece of fire is really fascinating for developers. So it's super meta, like you, everything in fire is, is self-described. Um, there's, there's all these resources that actually describe how fire is built so that like you could essentially throw away everything, patient, practitioner, uh, if you were just left with the infrastructure resources, you could redefine fire um, just from those. Um, the first one that's really cool is capability statement. So it's sort of a way of expressing what your fire server can do to the outside world. And um, it also functions uh, not only as sort of what you can do, but it's it's also what a client can do. And then it's also can be a specification, <laughs> like fire is a specification of what a server should be. Um, so we'll talk about that when we talk about profiles a little bit. In the restaurant, this is sort of like just putting your menu online, saying, hey, like, you don't have to walk by. It's not posted in the window. You can just check it out, pull it down for free. Um, the next fundamental building block is this thing called structure definition. So it's another resource. And this essentially defines other resources. So it has places to put all the properties that are in a resource, um, sort of what's required, what values it's bound to. Um, so if it's something that you pick from a list, you know, it, it's all in there. Um, in the restaurant world, I think of this as like, you know, listing the ingredients on a, on the menu item. So, you know, you, you know that, uh, you know, if you're allergic to something or <laughs> you're looking for a particular property on patient, um, you know, it's there. Uh, operation outcome is, is again, like more logging and tracing. So um, if you make a request and it fails, 
that is actually that failure is also a resource. So it, you know it has details about what went wrong, um, and you can sort of build systems where you can track those and query those and look at those as logs. Um, I thought of that one as just sort of getting your receipts electronically, um, and sort of having an audit trail. Uh, graph definition is a newer resource. That's kind of cool. Um, it's not specifically tied to GraphQL, but healthcare is naturally like very, very graph based, right? You have a patient and they have all these problems. They take these medications. All these things are, have pointers back to each other. A graph definition is essentially a way to build a path through a graph um, and potentially like query all of that at once, but it just define it as saying like, hey, these are related resources and they connect in this way. Uh, it's like a wine pairing on a menu. So it just says, hey, this would be good with this and this one would be good with this. Um, and then, yeah, value sets and code systems. Um, they're really fundamental to any kind of interoperability paradigm. Um, you just um, of a given type is. Uh, and all of these put together, you can you can kind of build anything you want. I mean, Fire could be a foundation for any kind of API, um, not just healthcare. Uh, so super powerful. It sounds like we're having some audio yeah, Nick, issues. Nick, we lost we lost about twenty seconds of it. If you could just go back and <clears throat> maybe start over on that last slide, or at the sure. end, I guess. Sure. So. Um, yeah, I just heard that I missed the value set and code system. So again, these are resources um, where you can define sets of values. So if you have an enum, say, you know, it doesn't even have to be uh, healthcare specific, but a classic one is gender. Um, you just list them out. It's like key value pairs, and you can you can sort of define those as part of you know your implementation, your spec. Um, and then I think the the final point was just that when you put all these together, you don't Fire doesn't even have to be a healthcare specific API. This foundation for resources can be used to describe anything. I mean, you could use this for uh, an e-commerce website and define, you know, fire resources for e-commerce. It's that powerful and flexible. Um, is my audio doing better? Yeah, you sound great. Um, yeah. Um, so you can take those building blocks and create what's called a fire profile. Um, here I have the fire documentation for patient, you know, that's sort of one of the easiest resources to grab onto because, you know, everybody's, uh, we're all patients and, you know, some of these fields are, are pretty intuitive, right? Like telecom name, gender, um, but you'll see there's a column here, uh, that's abbreviated card stands for cardinality. Um, that means you know how how many of those fields you can have. And if it has a one uh, dot dot one or one dot dot star, that means that it has must have one. Um, so you see literally nothing is required. If you have a link, you know you have to provide some things. You'll see some ones down there and sort of sub types or subfields. Um, but nothing's required. So if if you want to say I do fire, uh, that doesn't really mean anything because no, nothing is required. You could really just, you know, send back uh, a patient resource with an ID. Um, you know, ID uh, is the sort of like restful URI, and that would be, you know, purifier. Um, there's no data; it's just an ID. But yeah, um, give people a, a second here. It looks like some people are refreshing. Um, The, the key, so the key thing is that these fire profiles are, are were built into the spec from the very beginning. So you could build rules on top of the base spec. Um, the most, you know, sort of advanced, well-developed profile is the US core profile. Um, it's not just patient, it's a bunch of other resources as well. And this is now part of, you know, US federal law. Um, 
it, it's not strictly required. There's incentives to use it in different different groups or incentivized in different ways. Um, but you'll see now there's there's a few more required fields. So identifier is required, um, gender is required, and uh, there's you know a few more fields that like uh, up at the top there are U.S. core race, ethnicity, birth sex, things that are not in the base spec that are included in the U.S. version. Um, and this is all accomplished through structure definition. So it's really powerful um, in terms of uh, adapting fire to a particular use case. You could imagine, you know, um, there, there actually used to be a property on patient in older versions of fire um, called animal, I believe, or species uh, to use patient for non-humans. Which happens. I mean, there's, there's, uh, you know, a lot of hospital labs will will do tests on animal specimens. Um, the that was taken out of patient. You know, I think not many people would find that that controversial. But um, you could you could again adapt patient to use it for animals um, using one of these profiles. So it's it's very sort of flexible and adaptable for different use cases. Um, I talked a little bit about capability statements. So capability statement is also part of US Core. And I think this is kind of where um, I start to see some, some frustrations with FHIR um, and just being too open-ended. And this is not necessarily FHIR being open-ended. This is more US Core being open-ended. And it's more of a like, hey, what's the minimum bar that people should meet? Um, so these are sort of the rules for US Core. To be a US Core Fire server, you have to do these things. Um, you have to support that patient profile. Awesome, nice. Then rule number two is you have to support one additional profile. So it's like, what? Uh, which one do I pick? You know, <laughs> um, it leads to that. Just leads to inconsistency, right? Um, so if you're trying to meet the minimum bar, that's a pretty low minimum bar. Um, you know, then implement the RESTful thing, nice. Use these status codes, cool, cool, cool. Support JSON, awesome. And then there's kind of less strict recommendations, so should, right? Support XML, okay, that. Right. Like, tell me what to do or, or tell me what not to do, but don't give me a choice <laughs> of supporting both JSON and XML because I'm never gonna support XML. Uh, as a developer, right? It's just like an extra project that unless someone's paying me to do it, I'm not gonna do. Um, and then, yeah, you know, then there's like really arbitrary strict, you know, specifications for uh, particular questionnaire resources um, and stuff starts to go off the rails, right? Um, the problem to me, uh, you know, the, the, there's all this really powerful meta programming around it, um, but it's a lot like the, the MTV TV show, Pimp My Red. So there's, you know, the previous standards were akin to having a broken transmission. Uh, and what we got was like, you know, totally pimped out car, HGTVs, video game consoles, big tires, we might not need all this stuff, and we're certainly not ready to use it all. It's the kind of car we would probably not be like super happy to drive. Um, there's lots of efforts underway to make this easier, though. So um, there's a project called Fire Shorthand to make building those profiles a little bit easier. Today, the process is really just you know you make an Excel spreadsheet that then turns into JSON and takes that structure definition. Um, Fire shorthand ideas, you can kind of just type it out and it builds it for you. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, profiling fire is something that only a few people in the world can do. I think the number, um, there's no certification or anything, but the number is probably like well below a thousand people, um, if not a hundred. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard work and uh, you can see that it's sort of been written into the US law, so it's very valuable. Um, but nobody's super pumped to do it, right?
Cool. So um, this is a lot to digest here, and this is this is sort of my conclusion on fire. Um, it, it's sort of a new paradigm. Uh, I mentioned I made brief allusions to the to the other HL7 standards that are sort of much more widespread HL7 version two and CDA. Um, and there's a lot of kind of weird overlap that you can build this kind of table. So when it comes to uh, how you do authentication and authorization with these, um, HL7 version two is very much like within the hospital network itself. So there's no built-in auth in, auth seed protocols. It's just sort of, you get a blast of messages across a TCP socket. Uh, and this is most of what Redox does. Um, CDA is, you know, they've, they've sort of adopted SAML. It's all XML based. Um, the, the actual sort of, you know, um, authentication and authorization comes from also having trust networks. So a lot of times um, to join a network like Care Quality, you, you exchange client certificates um, and sign SAML assertions with your private key and then you're sort of let in. And then Fire uh, is, is new and we're still sort of figuring out how um, Fire should be used and deployed. But the, the predominant model is uh, a per user basis and it uses OAuth, um, specifically Smart on Fire. So um, kind of dovetailing off that, there's different sort of legal basis that these things operate under. Um, so for patient access in, in the OAuth world, um, patients have a right of access under HIPAA to their own data. And that's where we're sort of seeing the regula regulation um, come out around, around FHIR and, and Smart on FHIR. Um, so patients should be able to send their data wherever they want, give it to whoever they want. And yeah, these rules are, are sort of forcing that upon the vendors who can like you know provide the data. With uh, the networks and the exchange type things, there's another clause under HIPAA for treatment, payment, and operations. And people just refer to that as TPO. So there's there's sort of an inherent trust uh, amongst all the parties that they're they're sort of you know people with legitimate reasons to access the data. And you sort of say up front, hey, this is for the treatment of this patient. Can I have their history? Um, and then when you get into this the sort of HL7 version two world, you're, you're typically signing a, a business associates agreement with the health system to sort of process that much data. Um, and you're, you're essentially becoming a part of their, you know, internal network to some extent. Um, the implementation time with fire is, is very short, right? You, 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 in most cases to do one of these patient authorized or provider authorized apps, just registering in a portal, getting a client ID in secret, and then, you know, there's a number of off-the-shelf OAuth libraries you can use. Um, with CDA, you need to take time for that trust. And then with HL7 version two, there's a security piece you have to build and then a sort of um, a little bit more data mapping and understanding. Um, conversely, then the amount of data you get uh, is sort of inversely proportional to the implementation time. So for the long implementation time, you get the most data. You're trusted more than you are, say, with uh, other methods. Um, in that middle ground, you sort of have access to a limited set of clinical data and some notes. And then with FHIR, um, you know, what we're seeing with the new regulations, it's read-only, uh, very, you know, pretty similar to CDA in that middle, that middle tier, but um, read-only, access to clinical data notes, that kind of thing. Um, so the real question, uh, FHIR has tons of, you know, FHIR can replace these other two paradigms. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, will there be effort to move it sort of up that trust stack um, and build, you know, build replacements for these other two things? And yeah, I'm, I'm sort of not seeing that happen super fast, uh, the, you know, if anything, um, the next wave of fire will be sort of 
focused on, on, on again, some of these patient access things. Um, there's definitely, you know, claims data, payer data, insurance companies are also required to do this. And those are a little bit further behind the clinical side. Um, and, you know, it's an open question as to whether or not this new regulatory environment will keep things, you know, even more solidified in this current division, or if, uh, you know, it, it can it can spur more interest in fire and sort of help it propagate up the stack here. Um, and then a quick plug, um, Brendan, my colleague, has, has done a great webinar on the history of standards and, and sort of um, covers a lot of these topics from a more historical perspective. I think he's one of the leading experts in the world on uh, where HL7 came from and why we have the standards we do. Um, and this is a really great watch. So check that out on our YouTube channel.